So short form content is a big deal. Every major social media platform allows for it and in some cases prefers it. But what is the best way to use short form video? And what's some of the practical things that you should know in order to get the maximum benefit out of using short form video content? Today in our lesson, we're gonna answer those questions and explore some other practical things that you should know in order to get the most benefit out of using short form video content. Teaching you to make useful content so that you can build long-term relationships with the people that matter to your business. Hello and welcome to the Useful Content Podcast. I am your host, Juma Bannister, and today we have a new teacher in the Useful Content Classroom, Alex Miner. How's it going? We're going well, Alex. Uh, we are by no means strangers. You were on my previous version of the show and that went really well so now you're back so alex tell us a bit about who you are and your journey to creating useful content well i live in the infamous state of florida in the united states and i run a company called i am media we're a video marketing and podcasting agency and the way that i got here is kind of a long winding road but suffice it to say i've, I've been a long a lifelong creator just the method of creation has changed over time. First it was writing, then it was music. Now it's the videos. And, you know, I have a particular set of skills and, you know, to some folks that makes me valuable. And I try to give as much value as I can and just, you know, use the things that I've learned to help other folks benefit. Excellent, excellent, excellent. I didn't know, I didn't realize that you had added on podcasting to your service offerings. That, that was all the way back in 2020. I think it started more towards the end of 2020 or maybe early in 2021. And it, and it just came from client demand. I had one client who, you know, approached us and asked, hey, can you help us create a video podcast? This was a client that we had already done previous video work with. And we were like, yeah, we can do that. And so we helped them launch their their podcast. And then, you know, another contact referred somebody to me uh, because someone had approached them to help do a video podcast. And they were actually getting out of video production and more into just doing coaching. And so they referred that person to me. And that person has been a client for probably like two, three years now. So it's it's been good. It's been good. And it's really just been the demand of the market. And then us having those video skills that other podcast agencies lack mm -hmm. or, you know, didn't have the capacity to handle because, you know, a lot of people still think of podcasts as an audio format, but it's moving more and more into the video realm or into the multimedia realm where, you know, just having an audio podcast it can be enough, but if you're trying to grow quickly and you're trying to increase your reach and increase your impact, then the video component is really important. Yeah. So would you consider yourself uh, still a video first agency? Oh yeah, definitely. And, and when I say we're, you know, a podcast agency now, it's a specifically video podcasting. I'm, I've tossed around the idea of producing audio podcasts, but I'm just not interested. The technical part isn't a, isn't a challenge. It's just really when it comes to being able to give people a service that's going to help them increase the impact of their show mm -hmm. and increase the reach of their show. I firmly believe that you need to have that video component mm -hmm. to be able to take full advantage of repurposing content and being able to have like a multimedia strategy. And and so I'm, I only want to play in that sandbox where people want to have video as part of it. I think that is really something that many people are missing out on. When you talk to people, how do you convince them that that's the way to go? Well, one, I don't try to convince anybody. If I have to try to convince you, the conversation's already over. Uh, because the only clients that I've had that, you know, whether it's just a straight up video client or a video podcasting client, when they approached me, they already knew that video was the direction they wanted to go. They knew that video was already a good idea and a valuable tool. And so I didn't have to convince them 
about video. I just had to convince them that we could deliver the value that they were looking for when it came to whatever strategy they were trying to implement. Like, I'm, I'm not interested in working with somebody where I have to, like, you know, drag them kicking and screaming to to doing video content for their brand because one it's not going to be a good time for them or for me and the whatever content we do create is probably not going to come out that great Mm -hmm. and i'm not interested in in producing subpar content so you got to know the video is a good idea and it's a good tool for your for you and your brand and you've got to have some level of excitement about it, uh, some level of enthusiasm, because I can't do it alone. Like a, a lot of folks now are trying to promote campaigns or promote services where they're like, yeah, we'll do everything for you. We'll, we'll, you know, write all the, we'll write all the scripts and we'll do everything. It's like, I, I work with a lot of subject matter experts and coaches and people who've been in their field for years. Do you really think that I can write all your content? that I know everything that you know about your industry is like, do you really think that content is going to come out good? Like I can guide you through the process. I can help teach you techniques to make writing scripts and things easier. But I mean, if you're a doctor, I'm not a doctor. Do you think I can really come up with the content and the scripts that a doctor needs to say to convey a good message about whatever aspect of medicine they're talking about? No, I don't have that knowledge. I mean, there are methods and frameworks that we can go through to try to help develop those scripts together, but I can't just do everything. You, you got to put in some work. Yeah, I've, I've always found that to be very strange. I've always found the people who are experts at things somehow feel like they're not able to come on video and talk about that thing with clarity and with confidence. So for some reason, people become experts and somehow become less confident about their ability to deliver. Have you found that to be true? Yeah, there's a couple of concepts there. So one is a thing that I call expert blindness. So a lot of times experts, because they're so deep into their subject matter, they start losing, they, they start losing perspective on the magnitude of what it is that they have. So there are things like, you know, if you're an astrophysicist or if you're a lawyer or you're, you know, like, you know, like a doctor, like we said before, um, there are going to be things that are severely commonplace to you or things that in your body of expertise become trivial or commonplace. And to the lay person, those are things that we've never heard about. Those are concepts that we've never considered, never touched, never been educated on. And so that information might be insanely valuable. Mm. But because you are so deep within what it is that you do, you're just like, oh, Yeah, yeah, that's whatever. But to, you know, someone like you or me who isn't part of that, it's like, you know, mind blown. And so that's one thing a lot of experts doubt themselves or doubt they have value to convey because they forget that the content that they're creating isn't for other experts. It's for people who aren't experts, who aren't well versed in their craft. It's for, you know, clients, customers, people who need their services or need that hard won knowledge that they spent years accumulating because we don't have it. And then the other part is that I have met some of the most confident, charismatic people in the world and you put a lens and a camera in front of them and they fall apart. And because when they're dealing with another person, another you you know, an organic being, they know exactly how to operate. They know exactly what to say. They know exactly how to relay their intelligence, their subject matter, because they know because they can respond to the verbal and nonverbal cues and kind of they have, you know, a person's energy will give them the map they need to navigate that situation. But when you got a cold glass eye staring at you, it can be intimidating. And so, You know, I've seen dudes that are super alpha male, been in their their, you know, zone of genius, their career path for 30 plus years. And I put on the camera and the lights and they're stumbling and, you know, just trying hard to put the words together. And it's like it's like, bro, we're just having a conversation. And and in that case, you got to you got to guide them through that process. And that's one of the reasons why I personally make content. Not that I wasn't making content before I got into this business. I was. Um, But one of the reasons why I keep making content is to help people see that I know what it's like to be on this side of the camera. Uh, There's tons of videographers or video companies, directors, producers, whatever, that have never been on the other side of the lens. 
And to me, that's doing your clients a disservice because it's like, how can you understand what it's like for them to be in that spot if you've never done it? Yeah, yeah. I agree with that so much. I think I think anyone who produces content for someone else should produce content for themselves. Uh, it helps you st not just stay fresh, but it helps you understand the kind of challenges that come along with doing that or what is up with being in front of the camera, what is up with the scheduling, what is up with the actually thinking of ideas and scripting and putting the whole thing together. So you get a first-hand understanding of the type of challenges that will come along with that. And I, I agree with you 100% on that. The great, great salvo, great opening salvo. Let's get into the, some of the details of what we want to teach the people today, our students in the useful content classroom. So we're going to talk about some short form video trends and possibly its impact on podcasting. And one of the things that you believe is that short form video is the most accessible and most impactful form of social media marketing available today. Why do you believe that? Why is that true? I mean, just look at the proliferation of it, man. Like TikTok became a thing. Uh, well, it, and it even goes back before TikTok. It really goes back to like Snapchat and Vine, where just this these sh really short videos made this big splash in forms in, in the form of entertainment and and it's just grown like because we've seen multiple platforms grow and prosper come and go because of this like i said first it was probably vine and snapchat and then tiktok became a thing and now because tiktok became so dominant yeah. now everybody's trying to copy what they're doing instagram added the stories and the in the reels, Facebook added the reels, a uh, YouTube added YouTube shorts. And there's so much traffic that is generated by this short form content across these different platforms. And it's really allowing people a unique opportunity to grow audiences in a way that you never could before. The people you've worked with, when you tell them, okay, do video content, are people always willing to shift across and say, okay, I'm gonna try this? So what I may do for a client is I'll encourage them to do more. Like, for instance, one of my podcast clients, um, when she first came to me, she wasn't really doing shorts or doing short form content um, to go along with her podcast. I mean, she had cut together a few clips on her own when she did her first season of the podcast because she was working with a company that, uh, you know, what I do wasn't really their thing. They they were really like a branding and web design company who had helped her do all the branding and c come up with the concept and name and everything and, and launch the podcast. And they were doing the video editing, but they didn't really like it. And so once they finished that first season, they were like, you know what? It's not our cup of tea. We're out. And so she had cut together some short form clips on her own, but the way the edit, I mean, she's not a video editor, like it's, it's not her thing, but they weren't really hitting. And so I made some suggestions of, hey, you know, the short form stuff is really impactful right now. It's really growing. And it'd be a good way to promote your episodes on your social media because, you know, most folks, if they're not doing that, most of their promotion of their podcast or social media is maybe a screenshot or a cover of the podcast or something, or maybe just a photograph. And it's like, yeah, I just released a new podcast episode. Why don't you go listen to it? And it's like, why would I want to go listen to it? Like, I don't know if it's going to be worth my time, oh. but when you can show them a preview, you know, which is what the short form content is for a podcast. If you can show them a clip from it, show them a preview, a, a bold statement, a, you know, mic drop moment, something like that, that might catch their attention and make them curious as to what's in the rest of the podcast, it's easier to get them to click that link, go over, listen to it because they've already got a taste. And and I just think it doesn't make sense that more people aren't doing that. So true. So is, is it complex or complicated to, to make these short form videos? How do you go about it? I mean, there's an art to it, definitely. And there are different, there are different styles some of the some of the easiest stuff to do is stuff that's really in the moment, you know, like BTS stuff. If you're the same way people would do like Instagram stories, like if you're someplace and something's happening and you just want to do a quick clip like, yeah, look at me. This is what we're doing. Like that's some of the easiest content to, to get. Right. Then if you're doing stuff like getting clips off a of podcast or, you know, just cutting a, a clip out of a YouTube video, that can be pretty easy. But 
there are folks who are really pushing the envelope and really making short form content into an art. Like people are, I mean, people take it to another level. People are doing skits. People are doing mini music videos. People are doing all sorts of things. People are using to fit a whole set of instructions, tutorial within a minute, or, you know, you can, most of these platforms now you can do longer than a minute, but when you first started, you couldn't. So the shorts are not always so short these days, <laughs> but but a lot of times they're still really impact. It's easier to start to get people's attention and hold people's attention if you're going shorter. So if you're like 30 seconds, but interesting, interestingly enough, I saw a study that was done using YouTube analytics and it said that the most impactful YouTube shorts, and this is specific to YouTube, this is what the analytics say, are the ones that are like between 50 and 60 seconds. So it's, so it's like if you want to get the, the most views for your shorts on YouTube, push it to 50 to 60 seconds. How do you find like what works? How do you know what, what will work for you? You got to experiment. You got to experiment. And, and that's one thing that a lot of folks aren't willing to do. They're not willing to take the time and try different things to see what works. They want to they want to know before they even start what's going to work and what's going to hit. And most of the time, you just can't have any solid idea of what's going to hit before you start just throwing stuff out there. And you've got to throw enough stuff out there that it that you're trying different things and giving people a chance to get a taste of your different little experiments and get you some feedback, get you some data, whether that's just the analytics, whether that's the engagement, the comments that people are leaving, the DMs that you're receiving. You got to get feedback. You got to get data so that you can start making intelligent decisions. And I understand it. People don't want to waste time. They don't want to waste energy. They don't want to waste money. But you got to break a few eggs to make an omelet, man. Mm. So typically, what would an experimenting with short form video look like for a client of yours? Depending on, on what kind of business they have and what kind of goal they've set for the content, it may be experimenting with those different content types. Now, if, if, uh, if, if it's like a podcast client, it may be seeing how short can we get these shorts? You know, and and does that help with getting people over to episodes or do we need to go with longer shorts? Do we need to make sure that the host is in every short or can we post shorts where it's just the guest talking and that be effective? Um, do we do we put like an intro animation on the short or do we not put an intro animation on the short? You know, how does that affect our retention time? You know, those sorts of things, because I've seen trends when I look at the analytics for, for different clients where th those things matter. You know, like if you have an animation on it and and you do that for several shorts, but you see in the retention time that as soon as the animation is done and people start seeing what's going on, they're leaving. It's like, oh, OK, we we need to get right into the, you know, into the meat of it and and try to give them more time to digest the content and, and latch on to something. And what you're saying, there seems to be a one side where you make the long form content in video, video first, and then you repurpose into shorter clips, which you can then distribute on the platforms that matter to you. But then mm -hmm. there's the whole idea of making what you mentioned before, like BTS and these standalone pieces. How do you balance and how do you choose in between those two things? Sometimes, sometimes you'll be constrained by their budget. Maybe they don't have the budget to have you come following them around for a day just to get BTS content. Maybe they've only, maybe based on whatever packages you have or services provide, all they can do is like talking head, you know, short form video content where you're doing it with scripts. You can bang out like 30, 30 videos in two, three hours and and, you, and then just post produce, or maybe it's got to be a thing where it's just repurposing the podcast because they're already doing that. So sometimes, so sometimes you're, you're constrained by budget, you're constrained by time that your client has available to you. But as much as you can get them to experiment and try different things, I encourage that because you may find out that one form of content works better than another, or that the mix of content keeps things interesting and, and helps them captured new audience segments but but you know you, you kind of got to go with the flow like try to encourage them to to experiment and do as many things as possible without it negatively impacting their business 
And but also, you know, if they have limitations because of their business, because of their time constraints, respect that and just try to give them, you know, the best content that you can. So how long would experiments usually go on for? Do you kind of look at it and see what happens after a month, after two months, after three months? I mean, absolute minimum, you need to give stuff a month. And truth and truthfully, you need to be willing to give things like two to three months. I, I usually say three months to, to really see momentum build and to really affect change because, you know, marketing and branding, is it's a process and it's rare that you're going to put out like one piece of content and something goes viral or something really hits it. But there's also a downside to that. Because if you put out one piece of content and all of a sudden it blows up, that can that can be the death of people, because then all you're worried about is trying to replicate that instant success. And that can lead to analysis paralysis that can lead to you not putting anything else out. Um, It can lead to you second guessing everything that you're doing because you're like, oh, well, I I just put out another video after this one. And and that one did 100,000 views and this one did 2000. What is wrong? It's it's, no, it's not. Nothing was wrong. It's just that, you know, every piece of content ain't going to go viral. Every piece of content ain't necessarily going to do them numbers. And you got to be okay with that. And so if someone is putting on content, they're doing the testing, they have come to a point where they feel they're comfortable with a particular type of video. Uh, let's just say they love BTS or they love doing the, the podcast and clipping it out. So then what's the next step? If it's working, lean into it. If it's working, like when you, when you do figure out what works, do more of what works. That doesn't mean that you don't take any time to experiment and try to produce other types of content or do things that interest you or things that are fun for you. Because I fully believe that if you want to be consistent with content over time, it's got to, you got to find a way to do it that you enjoy in some aspect. There's got to be some aspect of it. So like for me, one thing I like doing is, is hopping on podcasts like this as a guest and talking to people, trying to get my expertise. And then I have an editor go through the, recordings clip that up for me and i put some of those out and those are some of my best performing piece of content because it's real it's raw it's not like it it sounds genuine because it is genuine i'm just talking in the moment Hmm. and and i mean i'm fairly smart the people i talk to are fairly smart if we talk for like 15 20 minutes one of us is going to say something smart (laughs) as long as i get one good clip i'm good (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> one or two good things may come out. And one of the things that you talk about, you talk about showing up more than everyone else. What does that mean? Well, when it comes to video and video content, most of your competition isn't doing it. And you can, and, and like, I don't care what you say. I don't care what statistics you may call to me about, oh, this percentage of marketers say they use video. Nah, bro. Most business owners are not producing videos. Most business owners are not consistently putting out content. Like, cause, cause I talk to business owners and most of the time they're not. And if they are like, they're doing the bare minimum, they've hired some social media company that's putting up posts for them. And a lot of the content is stock footage and just is basically like crappy advertisements is what they post. And And my thing is, I like for people to build genuine brands based off of who they really are and how they show up in front of their customers. And for me, that means getting your face on camera, making you look and feel, look and sound like a real human being and having you say the realest things that I can get you to say to that camera so that the people who would get along with you in real life or would be great customers for you would see you feel your energy and be like, I want to work with that person. Great. So in your experience, what's the, like the maximum and minimum amount of time somebody should appear with video content on a weekly basis? I I mean, absolute minimum once a week. And that's like the absolute minimum that it, it, and really like, I don't think that's enough. I don't, but if, if you can't do anything else once a week, but really, I want you to be on video as much as possible. If you can do once a day, do once a day. And for some folks, I know that sounds like a tall order. It sounds like a lot. But the truth is, if you can figure out or have somebody help you figure out 
a good system, you can record a month's worth of content in a day. There are some folks who are like, we can record several months of content in a day. And I'm of two minds about that because I'm very, when people tell me that, I'm very suspicious as to like the depth and quality of the content that you're recording. You know, when you're like, yeah, we're going to record three months worth of content in one day. And that means videos for every single, like a video for every single day. I'm just like, you're dialing it in on some of that stuff, bro. And look, there are some brilliant people out there who think of things that I've never thought of when it comes to content. I've had clients who have taught me things about how to repurpose content. There's a a woman I did a podcast with uh, about three years ago now who is still reposting and repurposing like two clips from that podcast three years later. And and every time I see it come up on my feed, I'm just like, ah, thank you for the lesson. She took like two or three clips that I cut up from the podcast, but there's this one clip she just posts over and over and over. And every time I see it, I'm just like, that's what I need to be doing. I need to be reposting these things over and over and over. This is what I need to teach my clients to do is repost these things over and over and over. Like it's, it's not done yet. You can use it again. <laughs> Why do you think people don't like to use the same thing over and over? What's the problem? Because it's old to you. Is because it's old to you. Cause like, and I'll, and I'll give you an anecdote. So like I have a, you, you brought it up a little bit earlier. I have a history as a rapper and entertainer. And when I first started rapping and doing shows, I had this mistaken thought that I needed to have a brand new song for every show I did. And, and like, this is before I ever put out an album or a mixtape or anything. So I'm just a kid, you know, making songs in the bedroom or whatever. But I thought I had to have every time I show up, I needed to have, a new song or else people will get bored. It's like, no, those songs are boring to you or you think it's not new because you're the one making it. You're the one hearing it all the time. But the majority of the time when you step out on stage or you put yourself online, the majority of the people who are seeing what you're doing and the you know, caveats to this are, are people who haven't seen it before. Mm-hmm. You know, even if they are followers, even if they've been following you for a long time, just because you put it up once don't mean everybody saw it. You know, if anything, 10, maybe 20 percent of people saw it. So there's no reason not to put it out again, because hopefully since the first time you put it out, your audience has grown, your reach has grown. And there are new people who wouldn't have even had the opportunity to see it the first time that you put it out. So go ahead and put it out again. So and so what if somebody who saw it before sees it for a second time, maybe they need to see it the second time to finally do business with you. Maybe they need to see the third or fourth or fifth or sixth time to finally do business with you. I mean, if you, you know, go into sales knowledge or, or, you know, sales coaching programs, they'll tell you like, it usually takes, I think it's an average of seven to nine points of contact before somebody actually, you know, engages with you for a sale. Mm -hmm. Why do you think your social media is any different? I find that to be so amazing. I mean, it, it catches me, even me, even I have that problem and I make a lot of content. Oh, we both do, bro. We both do. Like I've got so much stuff sitting on the hard drives and I'm like, and, and there'll be days where I'm, where, look, it happens to the best of us. It happens to me. It happens to Juma. There's days where I sit in front of the computer, like I got to make a post today. I don't know what to post. And, and I literally have hundreds of videos on my computer and, it, and it's just like, just post something. <laughs> It's hilarious. I counted the videos. It's 400 videos I've posted on LinkedIn. I, I, I counted it and I'm saying a lot of, the, probably about 20 of those. Well, you don't need to make another video for the next year, bro. Just repost stuff. <laughs> oh, it's, it's incredible. I don't know why the human brain is like that. We lie to ourselves about content all the time. Oh yeah. yeah. Dude, I'm so neurotic about it. I have to fight myself every time I sit down to post something. And, and, and the thing is, and it's funny because I work in this business, I make a lot of content. A lot of the content I make for my clients ends up on social media. I don't like doing it for myself. I mean, and mostly it's for myself. Like, I don't care if other people do social media. Like, I don't like to be on social media, (laughs) which is probably the weirdest sounding thing ever. But like, it's, it's like nails on a chalkboard for me. I just don't, I'd rather be doing other things. Yeah. Won't, won't be all. I'd rather be hanging out with the kids and developing other parts of the business, you know, um, rather than being on social media. It's so, so, 
so tiring sometimes. So which means that is encouragement for all of us to use the content that we have already. Yes. Yeah. Um, and as you alluded to earlier, you didn't allude to it, you actually said it. One of the best ways to do that is do a long form, say video podcast, and then you find the clips that are relevant. Now, how do you, this is the last thing we're going to ask. And the most practical thing I think for people, so you know, many people have podcasts. Mm -hmm. uh, many people have video podcasts. What is the most effective way to structure your podcast in order to get the most out of the short form clips? One thing that I, th and this is something that I've been brainstorming on for a while and, and something that I want to encourage more folks to do when they create their podcast is, is like really build out your podcast, especially if you're going to do a solo podcast, build out segments. So build things that you know you're always going to do in your podcast, because then it becomes super easy to cut up. Like if you like, let's say, for instance, maybe you've got some kind of podcast where one segment that you always do is like a review of tools or software. And it could be like something that takes you two minutes to to, to speak about, oh, this tool of the week is such and such. Well, it's super easy to now cut a tool of the week clip. Um, or if you have, if you do interviews, if you always have certain types of questions that you ask, or you, maybe you do a rapid fire question round that you always build into your interviews. Well, now you know you're always going to have rapid fire questions that those should be easy to cut up. So you can you can build out your podcast and structure in a way that there are going to be parts where you always know you'll at least be able to get one or two clips out of this thing. Or if there's a certain kind of question that you know always is really thought provoking and provides thoughtful answers from your guests. Uh, and, and sometimes these are things that you have to learn over time. But if you build these things into the structure of your podcast, and and uh, especially, you know, if you prep your your guests and let them know that you're going to be doing these sorts of things ahead of the time, you know, they can come prepared to have great answers for those things and so that it's more likely you're going to be get, able to get good short form content out of it. That's great. That's excellent. Structure it so that you can get the segments that you want that will produce the type of short form content that I guess is useful to you, uh, is relevant to your to your audience. As, as excellent stuff, Alex. Great. So Alex, thanks so much for sharing with us about short form content. Where can the people find you online? Uh, the easiest place to find me is on LinkedIn. I do plan on re-becoming a regular presence there. I've been kind of scarce lately because I've been just life was life is life in and been busy with the kids been busy with the business but i'm definitely trying to make my way back into the linkedin streets hopefully by the end of this year you'll find me to be in a regular presence on youtube because i need to get my channel back popping and you know just search for alex minor i think i'm probably the most active alex minor on the planet except i think there might be a a pretty well-known athlete like track and field guy but other than that like, I think I'm the best Alex Miner there is. And you should be too. <laughs> Actually, Google that guy. I found him today. I didn't know he existed. I mean, you know, he's he's gaining on you. So you need to be more active on YouTube. Yes, I do. Yeah, yeah. All right. So thanks so much, Alex, for being in the useful content classroom and for teaching us students about short form video. Uh, bye, everyone. And thanks for being here in the classroom. Useful content classroom dismissed. Do you have like a school bell go off after you say that? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Me. <laughs> the Useful Content Podcast is brought to you and produced by Relate Studios. You can see the work we do on our website at relatestudios.com. If you like what you've heard on the podcast today, please follow and come back in two weeks for another great episode. And if you want to get more useful content in between that, you can follow me, Juma Bannister, on LinkedIn and on Twitter. We all know it's still Twitter. See you soon in the useful content classroom.